the not too distant future. sunshine into your lives on this edition of Beyond 2000 when Amanda looks at an illuminating Japanese development. We'll try to shed some light on the question, are we alone? When we continue our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And we'll go where there's no light at all, towards the center of the Earth. Hello and welcome to Beyond 2000. The technological advances of the last few decades have seen massive changes in many areas of our society, particularly employment. For example, computers have completely altered professions like architecture, banking, and even teaching. Some jobs, though, such as radio announcing, haven't changed much since the 1950s. But, as the saying goes, nothing stays the same forever. And good morning, Perth. Bird Show on Better Music 6 p.m. on a Monday morning. I bet you'll be a ripper day for you today. This is the public is perception of the professional radio announcer. Cool, calm and collected, regardless of the hour and the pressure placed on them. But what the public doesn't know is what these people have to go through before they go on air. Harrison on Better Music, 6 p.m. with Bird Show. The time coming up 18 minutes to 6 o'clock. You know, a chilly old day in Perth today. Eight degrees the top. You know, maybe. most of the old radio hands pride themselves on being able to put in this kind of performance. It requires not only extraordinary physical agility at juggling the cartridges and the faders and the switches and the microphones and everything else, but it's often done at inhospitable hours of the day. And it's a system, though, fraught with hazard because so many things could go wrong. So why don't you drop in there today? 18 to 6 is the time. Not only is the traditional cartridge system clumsy and very labor intensive for the radio announcers, but it also leads to embarrassing mistakes on air. In the computer age, there just has to be a better way. A West Australian company, Southern Broadcasting, think that they may have found the solution with a system that's already turning heads in the radio industry around the world. DAMS, it's called, D-A-M-S, and it's a computer-based system for storing music and commercials on hard disk. DAMS stands for Digital Audio Mass Storage Unit, and it eliminates the frantic search for a particular commercial or disc and provides easy access to an announcer for all of that material. Material from a record or cassette is converted from an analog signal to a digital code and then stored on the hard disk of the computer. Yippee! The announcer retrieves a particular piece by simply keying in the ID number on the console and then pressing the play button, sending a message to the DAMS unit to convert the digitized code back into analog for broadcasting. Up to four items can be programmed to run either in sequence or randomly, just like in the old cart machines. And because the music is stored digitally, the sound quality isn't eroded with continuous use. DAMS, being a computer-based system, enables the radio station to keep an up-to-date record of all material broadcast. The computer automatically bills advertisers as their commercials go to air. At the same time, it provides station managers with an accurate picture of the day-to-day -day traffic in the station. We're in the radio control room at 6 p.m. This is the DAMS unit here. The black box here converts a digital signal into analog ready for broadcast. In here, the opposite is done. It's the digital audio encoder and it encodes an analog signal of commercials or music onto a digital format. This is the system controller. It's a computer that controls all of the flow of data into and out of the system. And here is the hard disk storage. As you can see, material is at this moment being drawn from disk number one. At the present time, the total storage capacity
capacity of the system is about 540 minutes of programming. That's around about nine hours. Which, put simply, it means that now all of this fits into this. But of course, the people who truly appreciate this system are the announcers. They can reduce the chaos normally associated with getting themselves on air, and once settled into the studio, have all the music and commercials at their fingertips. All they simply need do is arrive with their program log and uh, let electronics do the rest. They can ideally pre-program every bit of insert material into the digital audio mass storage unit. All they then simply need do is key in the identity number of whatever commercial or disc they want to play. They can sequence it and then they can sit back and relax and use the valuable time they then have to think about what they're going to be saying in the studio. The reason I'm a little upset is I went to the doctor yesterday and he said to me, Berger, he said, you know, you can look after yourself better. It's old age. I said, really? I said, I'd like a second opinion. He said, you're ugly as well. Oh, oh isn't but it? with what? jokes like that, maybe the dam system will one day replace announcers too, or at least write their jokes for them. We'll dig deeply in search of our next story on Beyond 2000. picturesque slice of German countryside, but closer inspection reveals some strange happenings in the rolling hills. Much is known about life on Earth and life above the Earth, but despite our long-term tenancy on this planet, we still know very little about what lies within, down there, so to speak. Here in Bavaria, near the quaint little village of Windeschessenbach, a team of nearly 300 people has embarked upon what is the most ambitious project yet into the centre of the earth. They're going to dig a hole that will be nearly 14 kilometres, or 9 miles deep, and take up to 10 years to complete. So vast is the project that a pilot hole is being drilled first to explore new technologies and new techniques. This will take the team three to five kilometers into the Earth's upper crust. The region was chosen because three to four hundred million years ago, it was where the continental plates of Asia, North America and Africa overlapped. These plates actually move from between one to seven centimeters a year. Earthquakes are the potentially catastrophic result of sliding plates. California's San Andreas Fault is a good example. The superhole won't reach halfway through the Earth's crust. However, even at 14 kilometres, scientists will learn a great deal about the forces and potential energy sources locked within our planet. We want to understand the structure of the continental crust to uh, be able to make prediction from surface geology about the interior of the Earth, about the distribution, for example, of ore deposits within our crust, or about the depth distribution of temperatures. We don't know presently very much about the temperature within our crust. The world's deepest hole at present is on the Kola Peninsula in the Soviet Union. But after 16 years and at 12 kilometers into the crust, technical and financial problems have overwhelmed the project. West Germany's Ministry for Research and Technology is going to great lengths to avoid those problems. More than $500 million is at stake. The cutting edge of the entire project are the drill bits, which after all must do all the hard work as they bore away into the Earth's crust. These are diamond tipped, and this one is the best performed so far in the pilot hole, drilling for a depth of 97 metres, and as you can see by comparison with the new one, this is much more worn. But what the scientists can't predict is just what will happen to the bits in the deep hole and how long they'll last because at 12 to 14 kilometers, the temperatures are up around 300 to 350 degrees Celsius. The pressure at that depth will be up to 4,000 times that of the air at sea level. Any equipment used will be sorely tested. To cut down friction in the drilling process, huge vats of a specially developed coolant 
are pumped into the drill roll and down into the hole itself. The deep hole rig will stand nearly twice as high as the pilot rig. Bore rods 40 metres or about 130 feet long will plunge into the earth. A hydraulic top drive unit can work at 600 revs per minute, a system unique to this project. People will never find their way into this hole. At its widest, it will be 38 centimetres or 15 inches across, tapering to 20 centimetres or about 8 inches at full depth. This is the platform where three separate crews are working 24 hours a day. It's not as noisy as most because this unit is running off electrical power rather than diesel. Progress is steady but fairly slow. At the moment they're drilling about 20 metres a day and the hole is at a depth of 1,767 metres or just over a mile. In a moment drilling will cease while they retrieve the core barrel to take another core sample. Painstaking ritual is carried out every 10 metres. While the core recovery has been an amazing 97% in the pilot hole, at greater depths, the team only expects about 30% core recovery. Each sample is treated as if it's gold, and it's quite possible that some of the rock that comes up will be just as valuable. This is a core sample taken from a depth of just over 1,700 metres. It's sedimentary rock that has been metamorphized over its roughly 400 million year lifespan. But what the scientists have to do now is to literally recreate its history so they can begin to understand something of the forces that have been at work on it. And the first stage is to test it for its magnetic properties. At some time in its history, this rock was subducted or pushed down into the Earth's mantle, about 50 kilometres below the surface, before being pushed back up again. In what has become a research institute in itself, the on-site laboratories are a centre for non-stop study and testing. A geophysicist is measuring the velocity of the compression waves in this sample, the very same waves that might cause an earthquake on the surface. This unique X-ray machine analyzes the chemical properties of the rock in a powder form. A computer then does a mineral profile of the sample. This is a cross-section of an electrical sensor probe which is lowered by cable down into the hole. Measurements such as temperature, radioactivity, the size and the deviation of the hole are taken every 100 metres. Then every 1,000 metres, drilling is shut down for two weeks, while more extensive tests and measurements are carried out. For the next 10 years, scientists will be poring over this information as if the future of the world depended on it. They may find a way of harnessing geothermic energy, a result of the unearthly heat that emanates from the core of our planet. They may learn to predict where and when earthquakes will occur or volcanoes erupt. This journey to the centre of the Earth is science and technology combined in its purest and most wondrous form. Are these divers out of their depth? Find out after the break. Standing up straight seems to be one of the most important lessons drummed into us, and for good reason. I remember when I was at school, the teachers seemed to spend more time putting books on our heads than allowing us to read them. But technology, it seems, has saved literature from further misuse in the form of this little gadget. No, it's not James Bond's holster or even a Masonic apron. It is called the Posture Monitor. As you can see, it straps under the arms and across the back. The buckle is fitted with a battery-powered alarm. When standing upright, silence. But as soon as you relax and let the old bones roll forward, look out. It beeps on you. If your problem is a little lower around the waistline, this model may be just what you need. The electronic Weight Watcher. Just strap it on and stop eating. So, shoulders back, stomach in and try to relax.
This is Statford Charlie, the largest oil and gas rig in the world. But below the waves that surge up against this man-made atoll in the North Sea are kilometres of pipes, junctions and wellheads. They have to be constantly monitored, adjusted and welded. This is the job of a special breed of deep ocean diver, the saturation diver. It's a tough, dangerous life. And here on the outskirts of Hamburg is where some of the safety standards and depth frontiers for deep ocean diving are established. The GKSS diving simulator known as Guzzi. The Guzzi Centre is really a collection of high pressure chambers where human divers breathe exotic gas mixtures and are subjected to enormous pressures. They can commute to the pressure equivalent of inner space by just stepping through an airlock hatch. It's the only place in the world where divers have been able to work at a depth of 600 metres. Now that's nearly 2,000 feet. They breathe a special gas concoction known as Heliox Trimix. 65% helium, 30% oxygen and 5% nitrogen. At this depth, the nitrogen that we breathe at surface pressure would be so thick it'd be like trying to suck treacle through a straw. So the lighter helium is used to thin the gas so the lungs can inhale it. The reason they're known as saturation divers is that after 24 hours during initial compression, their blood becomes saturated with the heliox mixture. During decompression, they have to stop at various depths so that the helium can be expired naturally through the lungs. If the decompression is too fast, the helium fizzes out of their blood like the bubbles in a cola bottle when it's open. These bubbles cause the bends. They disrupt circulation, cause deafness, irreparable damage to the central nervous system, and perhaps death. And remember that uh, if anything medically happened to them, they just can't get a doctor in there. From uh, the equivalent of 50 bar, that's 500 metres, it could take six days to get them safely back to the surface. The most feared problem is high pressure nervous syndrome, or HPNS. The pressure and accumulated blood impurities cause memory loss and bone necrosis. The tissue of the bone dies, and sensitivity of the nerve ends is seriously affected. One of the real problems is communicating at that great depth. And the reason is that uh, sound is transmitted faster in helium than it is in nitrogen. And also the heliox mixture has a strange effect on the human voice box. And in fact, when they start talking down there, they sound like Mickey Mouse. A lot of work is being done here on refining the special unscrambling devices that makes their voices intelligible. I'll give you an example. Hello, Klaus, can you hear me? I didn't understand a word he said. Could you repeat that now, please, Klaus? What does it actually feel like at uh, about five or six hundred metres or fifty or sixty bars? Do you actually sort of feel the pressure itself? And what about when you're breathing? Well, I it doesn't feel the pressure, but uh, you can see it that they're breathing. It's very, very hot. So everything is doing and uh, it's very hot that we eat uh, for such dry food. You know, uh, all you can eat is must be very uh, lot of water and uh, you want it here. Otherwise you can't eat. The divers have every convenience except privacy. TVs, videos, even a personal computer that's used for testing their logic skills. But Klaus, who's now done eight very deep dives, doesn't admit to being troubled by the risks he's running. One of the main research thrusts at the center is hyperbaric dry and wet welding. When you consider a simple pipeline repair at depth can cost $5 million and upwards, it's not difficult to see why. There's also a special tidal tank to simulate welding and working underwater. A six metre deep tank where the salt content can be altered to simulate any of the world's oceans. 
and then generate a one knot current surge just to make things interesting. Well, I'm just about uh, prophylactically sealed in just about all of the gear that uh, a saturation diver would wear. And now I'm just about to have my first underwater welding lesson. Okay, Manfred. I'd be lying if I didn't admit to some apprehension about getting into all this regalia. Once that helmet's on, you can't get it off without help. That's to make sure that divers don't think they're fish if they get raptures of the deep and try to rip it off. The rig makes you feel incredibly clumsy and claustrophobic. Things could be worse, I suppose. They can seal off the light completely if they want to. So it'd be like working at, say, 300 metres. Then we'd have to work just by the light of my helmet. That'd be real cosy, I don't think. It seems certain that by the turn of the century, oil and gas fields will routinely operate in water four to 500 metres deep. Although there have been advances in robotics, it's thought that it will be 2010 before human divers become completely obsolete at these depths. And who knows, the next frontier for these pressure and gas technologies may be on the inhospitable terrain of another planet. I think I'll, I think I'll hang on to my day job. <laughs> Still to come on Beyond 2000, plants and people with sunlight on tap. But after the break, the search continues for extraterrestrial intelligence. In the last 40 years, we've witnessed the rise of the UFO phenomenon. On the last edition of Beyond 2000, we investigated the steady flow of strange sightings and reports of unidentified flying objects from all over the world. Despite extensive research on the subject, we still have no proof that aliens have visited our planet. But is this to say other civilizations don't exist? Are we the only intelligent spark in the vast bonfire of the universe? These days, technology can take us across even the vast reaches of space. And with that power to listen to the distant galaxies, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has left the fringes of science. In fact, it's very legitimate science indeed, with millions of dollars being devoted to the search in both the Soviet Union and the United States. Its practitioners believe that if successful, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence could become the most significant event in human history. By comparison, even the splitting of the atom would be insignificant. Are we alone? In this edition, we embark on the quest for contact. The human race is already broadcasting rather dubious proof of its advanced intelligence into space. It's called television. The carrier waves of our radar, radio and TV broadcasts leak from Earth and could be detected by distant civilizations. And if there are inhabitants on planets around the star Arcturus, they'll be wondering what to make of some of these antics in just a few years from now. Television gets out, and this is a very uh, dreary and depressing thought, that the principal indication to extraterrestrial civilization of intelligent life on Earth is the dreary contents of mainly American television programming, because that's the largest power, power output. So in case you've been wondering how come they haven't visited, now you know. The sun we're so familiar with is just one of 300 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, alone. Our Milky Way is only one of 10 billion galaxies in the presently observable universe. 
In fields as diverse as astronomy and molecular biology, scientists are discovering that the conditions leading to the origin and evolution of life are not unique to our sun and earth. And if the planetary systems surrounding stars like ours are the norm rather than the exception, then the universe may be absolutely teeming with intelligent life. And if it's there, NASA hopes to find it with its SETI program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's a quest that humankind has been on for millions of years. We've often wondered what those points of light are in the sky. We've wondered, are there other places where life could exist? And I think it's rather exciting right now that for the first time in history, we have some technology that we can bring to bear on that question, design an experiment, and do a search that may give us an answer to the question, are we alone in the universe? Which I think is a very profound philosophical question. NASA's SETI operation will proceed on two fronts. Over a seven-year period, it plans to survey the observable universe from radio telescopes around the world. It'll use those like Goldstone's antenna in California and the deep space tracking facility near Canberra. On a second front, NASA will search for weaker signals among what astronomers call good suns. That's stars within 80 light years of the Earth, areas thought likely to be habitable. To achieve this, some of the largest telescopes available will be used, including the 305 meter diameter antenna at Arecibo in Puerto Rico. NASA is looking for two types of signals, leakages of radio emissions from other planets, like those that leak from the Earth, and other stronger signals that advanced civilizations may be sending specifically to attract the attention of emerging societies. Arriving on the planet on the Earth is not the best way to make contact. If we imagine some civilization hundreds of light years on a planet hundreds of light years away, yeah, that's a big distance and uh, takes it warns enormous effort to get from there to here. I mean, much better is to send a message. It travels at the speed of light. Uh, it costs about as much to send a telegram from here to the nearest star as it does to send a telegram from uh, Sydney to New York, which may say something about uh, telephone company profits. But in any case, it's very cheap to uh, send messages over interstellar distance. And you can send, you can send the Encyclopedia Britannica equivalent amount of information in a week at current uh, transmission rates. So that's the way to do it. If uh, anyone wishes to communicate with us, send us radio messages designed to be so obvious that even really dumb civilizations like us would understand it. The SETI project will search in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. It lies in the frequency band between 1,000 and 10,000 megahertz. Of all the frequencies, this silent valley is where the background noise of the universe is at its quietest. And it's thought that this is the obvious place to post a message to another world. But digesting this massive amount of information requires extremely sophisticated computing power. The hardware and software that will make NASA's search possible is this multi-channel spectrum analyzer, a supercomputer that will scan 10 million radio frequency bands simultaneously. It's designed to sort and discard the false signals from pulsars or man-made sources like satellites and lock onto anything that just might be a message from an unknown galactic source. At a cost of about $100 million, the SETI experiment certainly has its opponents. The notion that radio is the ultimate means of communication is as silly as using smoke signals from 150 years ago as the ultimate means of long-distance communication. So I think it's, it's part of our makeup to wonder what's beyond the next mountain. It's part of our makeup to wonder what is the role of life in the universe? Are there others out there? Are we alone? Is there ever any chance we could get in contact? These are questions I think that are part of our human nature. I mean, it's a lovely conversation. Hello out there, 20 years later. Hi there, what can we do for you another 20 years? I mean, it's job security for radio astronomers and their kids, grandkids. But it doesn't come to grips with somebody coming here now. What does it mean to us here? But if we don't look, if we don't design experiments like SETI, or like looking for other extrasolar planets, then we won't know. We have to try. And because it's a long shot, uh, uh, Pro Professor Philip Morrison, who's a physicist at MIT, puts it this way. He says, you know, you're going on a fishing expedition, and you don't know what the odds are of catching that fish. So you keep your costs modest, 
you design your experiment the best you can and start casting and hope you catch it. And if you do catch it, it'll be one of a one whopper of a fish. It's a brave experiment, and in anybody's language, a long shot. Especially considering that we've only just begun to explore our own solar system. In fact, we've yet to even prove that planets exist outside our own neighborhood. If we could find another planet, prove beyond doubt the existence of a solar system other than our own, then the chances of there being intelligent life out there improve dramatically. It may even tip the odds in favor of those who believe in SETI. Still, the distances involved are so vast, it's much easier said than done. Yet we may be on the verge of a great new discovery. Ian investigates Israeli ingenuity. That's next on Beyond 2000. Electrical energy is the lifeblood of our modern world. But whether it's produced from finite resources like coal, oil and gas, or infinite ones such as solar, wind, wave or geothermal power, we still end up producing the actual electricity by using turbines of some sort. But now, there's a small revolution on the horizon. Here at Ben Gurion University in the Israeli city of Beersheba, important progress is being made in developing a system of large-scale power generation using no moving mechanical parts. It's a system which provides greater reliability, greater efficiency, and yet costs less than conventional methods. It's called Magnetohydrodynamics, or MHD. MHD works on the principle that a plasma, that is, a hot gas or a liquid, passing between the poles of a powerful magnet, generates an electrical current at right angles to the poles of the magnet. The concept of MHD is not new. It's been understood since the last century. But only comparatively recently have the necessary materials and the engineering solutions been available to make it technically feasible. Where the Israeli program differs from most of the other ones around the world is that it uses liquid metal instead of a gas plasma. First of all, metals are the best conductors, the best natural conductors uh, among all the possible materials. And the same applies to molten metals, to liquid metals. Professor Herman Branover, a Russian emigre who worked on Soviet MHD projects, now leads a team of Israeli scientists who've developed a liquid metal MHD pilot plant at Ben Gurion University. If you want to compare with uh, a plasma MHD, we can do it at much uh, lower temperature, which reduces enormously the material problems, engineering problems, and so on. In plasma generators, uh, those who develop them have to struggle very, very severely to get higher conductivity in uh, some cases they go also to very high temperatures like uh, at least 2,000, sometimes 3,000 degrees centigrade. With metals, all that is not a problem at all. In simplified form, the liquid metal MHD process works by injecting gas into the liquid metal. The bubbles make the liquid less dense and it rises. At the top, the gas escapes and the now more dense liquid falls passing between the poles of a powerful magnet which produces the electrical current. The process repeats as the liquid metal continues around a closed circuit. In the working prototype, this is where the process begins. It's a reservoir containing some 900 litres, about 9 tonnes, of a eutectic alloy of lead and bismuth which has a melting point of only 125 degrees Celsius. This is the mixer where the steam is injected into the liquid metal through a tiny system of porous stainless steel sparges. The two-phase liquid, the mixture of gas and uh, metal, then rises some eight meters to the top of the upcomer pipe. And up here is where the separation process occurs. So as the steam separates off the surface of the metal, and is collected in these condensers here, the metal becomes much more dense than in the original mixture. 
and it falls down through the pipe on this side here to pass between the poles of the magnet below. When the metal gets down to here, it's traveling at about one meter per second, but it's narrowed in at this point to a rectangular channel which speeds the flow up to about five meters per second as it passes through the magnetic generator assembly here. This pilot plant can generate about 10 kilowatts of electricity, but its output is not dependent on size. Just by increasing the heat input and some extra plumbing, the same plant could generate up to five megawatts of power. For the first uh, five or maybe up to 10 years, we think we will not go beyond uh, 10 megawatts. And uh, that's by the way one of the beauties of our system in comparison with plasma systems. Plasma systems are making sense only for hundreds of megawatts. Ours can be done uh, very small, relatively very small. I don't think below one megawatt but uh, between 1 and 10, it's absolutely feasible. Later on, we intend to go to uh, higher power levels, like 25, 50 megawatts, and maybe up to 100. The system can utilize a variety of heat sources, coal, oil, natural gas, geothermal heat, and even solar. The capital cost of building an MHD plant would be roughly the same as that of a conventional power plant. But because there are no moving parts, it would be much more efficient and use far less fuel. In the average, I think we can speak that under similar conditions, our system is able to provide at least a 10% improvement in efficiency. And that is enormous because usually on power plants, they're struggling for a fraction of a percent. Another area of potential for the liquid metal MHD system is in space. Professor Branover's team is collaborating with NASA and the US Energy Agency to develop an MHD system for satellites. The system is extremely attractive because it has no moving parts. And in space, where weight is crucial, MHD could deliver far more kilowatts per unit of weight than any other system. So what I foresee is that in the 21st century, uh, both liquid metal MHD for smaller scales and plasma MHD for bigger scales will play a very substantial role in the total balance of, uh, balance of electrical energy in the world. After the break, a complex contraption that provides the simplest of pleasures. AMP superannuation took Gino out of his dilly and into his dream. AMP super took Margaret out of a kindergarten and into the world. AMP super took Pete from the building industry into his holiday home. More Australians turn to AMP super funds to make their dreams reality. That's today's AMP. Australians sharing Australia. It takes time to create that Cracker Barrel character. The Cracker Barrel aroma. The Cracker Barrel taste. The Cracker Barrel texture. Cracker Barrel extra tasty. It takes time. This is what the average bathroom looks like. If you're the one who has to clean it again and again and again. Hospital Strength Domestos, however, removes all traces of bathroom plaque from porcelain surfaces, leaving them beautifully and hygienically clean. So your bathroom looks... Fantastic. Hospital Strength Domestos removes bathroom plaque. Lever and kitchen guaranteed. Mr. Okamura is paying a visit to a new NEC dealership. He's here to tell them something about NEC's remarkable range of computers. How NEC make everything from laptops to desktops, mainframes to huge supercomputers. And as you can see, he ends his little talk with the traditional visit to the golf course. <laughs> NEC, Japan's most experienced computer company, now very much at home in Australia. The really exciting thing about this year's Olympics is that everyone is going for the double gold. 
We'll see 800 meter archery, shot foot hurdling and high dive cycling. But the easiest way to get double gold is to go to McDonald's. Right now you'll get a double double burger and a large french fries all for just $2.75. Double the cheese, double the beef and large french fries all for $2.75. So go for the double gold at McDonald's. Now it's over to the gymnastic long jump. Hinch at seven. A Sydney taxi driver taken to court, and all because he refused an able-bodied fare in preference to a disabled person. Do you believe that you did the right thing? From a moral point of view, certainly. The wheels fall off taxis for the disabled, next on Hinch at 7. It's easy to take this for granted. Sunlight, and plenty of them. But in Tokyo, for example, where high-rise living is the norm, very few people have regular access to sunlight. Artificial lighting can't replace the warmth and therapeutic value of nature's rays. So a Japanese company has devised a fiber optic system to help throw some light on the problem. It's called Himawari, Japanese for sunflower. It's a bizarre futuristic looking contraption that sits on the roof of the Laforet Engineering Company building in Tokyo. Seven domes, each housing 19 Fresnel lenses, continually follow the sun and transmit the rays indoors via optical fibers. But the sunlight it pipes inside is more beneficial than the real thing. It's stripped of most of its harmful infrared and ultraviolet rays. The rays responsible for skin cancer and heat damage. It's based on the principle that there are three major components in sunlight. Ultraviolet, infrared and visible rays. Now this acrylic dome cuts out most of the ultraviolet and the Fresnel lenses inside the dome take care of the remaining UVs as well as the infrared. As the light hits the lens, it breaks it down into ultraviolet, visible rays and infrared. Each of these has a different focal point. The light conducting fiber is adjusted to the focal point of the visible rays only. The UV wavelength is too short to reach the fiber and the infrared too far to the sides. Some infrared gets through but not in damaging quantities. So between the dome and the lenses, almost 100% of the ultraviolet has been removed as well as one third of the infrared. This just leaves the visible rays to be optically transmitted. At each focal point is a bundle of 37 fibers, each 5 millimeters in diameter. They make up the cable that takes the light inside. Although only about 25% of that light arrives at the other end at present, 50% has been achieved in trials. It's been known for a long time that sun rays have therapeutic powers, particularly the essential vitamin D. And we all know the comforting feeling of sitting in the sun. So if you take out the harmful element of sunlight, you're left with what seems to be a very healing ray, capable of curing neuralgia, rheumatism, bed sores, muscle pain, even sore throats. So for the person who's bedridden and doesn't have access to sunlight, the mountain can now come to Muhammad. Anyone who's trying to grow African violets will appreciate the uniqueness of this greenhouse. Here we are in the middle of a Japanese winter in the basement of a five-story office block in the heart of the Tokyo Business District. Now, all they use here is a little artificial light, a humidifier, and this. Natural sunlight in a tube. But this sunlight has been robbed of all its harmful components. And this way, it's even better for the plants than the real thing. There's virtually no infrared or ultraviolet, both of which inhibit photosynthesis. And because of the infrared removal, there's virtually no heat at all in the sunlight. So under these conditions, you can grow anything from tomatoes to these tropical plants indoors all year round. Because not everyone has a use for such a large sunlight collector, Himawari has a smaller portable version for sale that can sit on a suburban roof or even a balcony. Sunlight can be transmitted to any area within reach of the 10 metre or 30 foot cable. This portable sunflower, like its namesake, will always follow the sun. And like its big brother, it uses two devices to do it. The first is this sensor here. It detects the sun's location and orders the lenses to track after it. The other one is in here. 
It's a microprocessor that's programmed to follow the path of the sun across the sky, even on cloudy days. These two sisters were among the first in Japan to buy the portable sunflower. Sunflower helps our parents and my sister. It's good for our health and for beauty. They use it regularly to relieve muscular pain, particularly tension in the neck, and they also recommend it as a beauty aid. <laughs> Judging by the appearance of this lady's skin, who am I to argue? <laughs> 